Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Now these videos are intended to provide a foundational and fundamental understanding of some of the basic principles in microbiology so that later on we can add more detail and learn from this. So if you've watched my videos, you're familiar with that concept and idea. You should also know that these videos are intended for uh, use by students who are in my courses, but if anyone else out there in YouTube land finds them helpful, by all means hit like and let me know. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the channel so that I want to add new videos, you're welcome to get them. Um, also, know that these videos are being done in a very rushed and hurried manner in a very simplistic way. It's a cell phone, me, and a board um, trying to meet some deadlines due to the COVID uh, situation. Uh, so please forgive me if they uh, aren't the most professional videos. I'm going to be working on redoing the videos in the near future when I have more time to make them nicer and better and, and the way that I want them to be presented. Nonetheless, <clears throat> now, in microbiology, we've been discussing a number of topics. We've been working our way through the textbook and through the chapters, talking about um, uh, the history of microbiology, what is microbiology, the tools of microbiologists, what kind of biochemical tests and microscopes that we use, how do we determine which organisms are present. Um, we've been looking at the organisms. We've discussed eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We've discussed the specific prokaryotes and a lot about bacteria. Um, and uh, we've discussed some eukaryotic microorganisms and organisms that at least are microscopic at one part of their life cycle that can cause disease. We've talked about viruses a great deal. We've done about some genetic, um, microbial genetics, and we've done some uh, recombinant DNA technology. We've covered a lot of ground. We're gonna start moving into more of uh, how do they affect us in the disease state? Since this is more of a health science course than it is a majors micro for, re for scientists and researchers, um, we're gonna focus on uh, how, do, how do we describe the disease state? What are diseases? Uh, how do we describe them? We're gonna talk about epidemiology a little bit, and then in future videos, we'll go into which uh, organisms cause which diseases and also some treatments and how do we treat diseases. So today is about disease and epidemiology. Now in order, to, in order to understand this, this entire chapter is really going to be a whole lot of definitions and uh, learning definitions, some of which you may be familiar with, some may be a little new to you. So when we're talking about disease, some of the basic definitions, and I'm just going to start listing some on the board here and writing out the definitions and talking about them, um, you need to learn all of these definitions. Now, um, first of all, we should talk about what is pathology. Pathology, anytime you have ology, that means the logic of or study of something, and pathos means uh, disease and death. So this is the study of disease and the processes which lead to disease and death. Okay, so when we're talking about pathology, we're actually talking about, um, we're talking more about the physiological nature of the disease. We're studying what is the physiology of the disease. What caused it? How does it affect the body? How does it impact the body? How does it, what processes is it disrupting in the body? And if we continue to disrupt those processes and cause a disease state, it could lead to death possibly. And so pathology includes sort of the study of death and disease and the processes which cause disease and death. And again, this is more of a physiological um, view of it, okay? Um, now, when we're going to talk about pathology, one of the things we need to talk about is what is called etiology or etiology. Now, this is the study of the uh, causative agent of diseases. What is specifically causing this disease? And since we're talking about microbiology, then we're talking about, is it a virus? Is it a bacterium? Is it gram-negative, gram-positive? Is it an acid fast? Is it a fungus? Is it a protozoan? Is it a helminth? What is causing this particular disease? What is the etiology of the disease? What is the causative agent, okay? Um, now, um, as we discuss some of these things, it's gonna lead to well, as we present the information, as I present it to you, sometimes we're gonna go over some concepts and then we're gonna come back to them a second time. But 
when we discuss etiology, the other thing we need to talk about is epidemiology. So when we talk about an epidemic, and we're going to come back to these definitions, but an epidemic is when we have a whole bunch of the disease occurring in a particular area um, above what we call the endemic rate of that disease. And again, we're going to do these definitions in a little bit, but epidemiology is sort of the study of an epidemic or the study of an outbreak of a disease. But when we talk about this, we're not just talking about the physiological factors. We're not talking about just the causative agent, but we're talking about what is the causative agent, how is it impacting an organism, and how is it impacting a population, okay? So when we discuss epidemiology, we're really talking about the study of the source and the effects, or we should say the source of the disease, the source and spread and effects of the disease within a population. So epidemiology is going to look at the etiology of the disease. It's going to look at the pathology. It's going to look at how the disease is spread within a population and also the impact on that population. How is it affecting or impacting that population? So when we talk about epidemiology, we're, that's what we're talking about is how is the disease actually affecting a group of people? Now, before we get too much further, let me erase some of these definitions to make room for more. And I may switch colors of markers on occasion only because the substance that is used to clean these boards will sometimes kill a marker and I have to let the marker sit and resaturate, so I'll switch colors sometimes. There's no rhyme or reason for, for some of it. Now, um, <clears throat> when we talk about pathology and etiology and all of that, then we must talk about, first of all, what is a pathogen? Well, gen means to generate or make and cause, and O is of, and pathos is disease. So a pathogen is any organism that can cause a disease. Now, when we're talking about a pathogen, we usually say an organism, but viruses are not considered living organisms, but they can still be a pathogen. So this is sort of a generic term, but it's any disease-causing organism or any organism that can result in disease. Um, and we're talking about human pathogens in this class in particular, since it's geared towards the health sciences. Now, when we talk about a pathogen, we need to talk about something, the term to colonize. To colonize means to live in an area. Just like if you were to go somewhere and set up a colony in a particular part of the country, you have colonized that area. You are living in that area. Some microorganisms colonize our body. Um, and we refer to them as the normal flora of the body or the resident flora. And we're going to come to these definitions in a little bit. Or we re now refer to it as the microbiome. They colonize an area. They're not always going to be pathogenic. And they're not always going to cause a disease. They're not always going to cause problems. Some organisms simply colonize an area, meaning they live there. Okay. Now, um, if we want to go beyond colonize, what we can well, when we talk about colonizing, one of the things we should talk about is what is the host. And the host is any organism a microbe can live in. So some microbes live in our body. We would be the host for that microbe. Some microbes live in the gut of a cow. So we would call those microbes, um, we would call the, co the cow the host for those microbes. Um, for a bacteriophage, then we would say the, the particular bacterium that that phage infects would be the host for that bacteriophage. So the, any organism that um, a particular microbe can live in would be called the host. Now, when we talk about this, a couple of other terms need to come up. And we could go endlessly with definitions, and we're going to do quite a few. But um, i got to draw the line somewhere. But these are some of the ones that I think are really important for you to know. Um, when we talk about contamination, okay, 
We're talking about the presence of a pathogen that does not normally live in that area. So contamination simply means the presence of microbes not native or natural to that part of the body or to that area. Okay. So, for example, we have some microbes that live in our skin. One of them is called Staphylococcus aureus, or S. aureus. You may have heard of Staphylococcus aureus. We've used it in lab, and um, it's a pretty common one that occurs in, in, and that we discuss because it grows on the human body on our skin. Staphylococcus aureus does grow on the skin, okay? It is not considered necessarily a contaminant on our skin. Now, if I were to break the skin and Staph aureus got into my bloodstream and started um, rapidly multiplying and releasing some chemicals and we could, could cause an infection, then we would say that's contamination. E. coli lives in our gut. It's not considered a contaminant in the gut because that's where it normally lives. But if E. coli gets into the urinary tract, then it can, it can contaminate the urinary tract and cause an infection. So contamination simply means the presence of microbes that don't belong there. They don't go there, so that area is now contaminated. Okay? Now, <clears throat> now, some related definitions that we can discuss when we talk about this is, um, after contamination, we can talk about infection. Okay? And when we discuss infection, what we're talking about is an invasion or colonization of an area by a microbe. Okay. Now, and uh, and, and really what we're talking about, it's, it's not just necessarily a microbe, I should say by a pathogenic microbe, one that can cause disease, okay? So when we talk about an infection, we're talking about a bacterium that has gotten into an area where it doesn't belong and it can generate disease. It has the, the capacity to generate disease. It doesn't mean it's always going to generate the disease, but it could. Sometimes our immune system will overwhelm it before disease occurs, but we still say that that's an infection, where you have an area that's been invaded or colonized by some pathogenic microbe. Now, um, uh, when, we, when we talk about infections, again, we're not talking about normal flora to the body or the microbiome. They're not considered an infection because that's where they belong, that's where they grow, that's their normal environment. We're talking about bacteria that are growing in an area or colonizing an area, have contaminated an area, and now begin multiplying and have the likelihood that they could generate a disease. And of course, then we get to the next definition when we talk about disease. When we talk about disease, this is a disturbance in homeostasis. Okay. Well, Homeostasis, as you should know, is the, um, the maintenance of a constant and optimal internal environment for us to continue thriving the way that we do. And anything that disrupts the homeostatic um, environment of a part of the body or the body in general, anything that disturbs homeostasis would be called disease. If you look at the name, dis means not, and ease means easy. So disease simply means difficult. When we disturb homeostasis, it's very difficult to continue functioning the way that we should. If disease continues, if a particular part of the body isn't functioning normally, that can disrupt the function of other parts of the body that are dependent upon that organ or that tissue. And then that can affect an organ system and then the whole organism can come crashing down. And so it could lead to death if it's not corrected. Sometimes our body takes care of it, sometimes we need medical intervention. It's all, that's all that we mean by disease. It's, it's a disturbance in the state of health or a disturbance in the homeostatic conditions in a part of the body. Now, an infectious disease, when we talk about an infectious disease, all we're talking about is an Ill illness that is caused by the presence of a pathogen. 
And so when someone talks about infectious diseases, you're talking about an illness or a disturbance in homeostasis caused by the presence of a pathogen. And they're called infectious diseases because as long as there is a pathogen present, that pathogen could possibly spread and infect other people. Okay? So, when we talk about, in general, a very simplified view of the disease process, we have three definitions that work together. Contamination simply means that we have some bacteria that are not normal to that area. If they grow and flourish they could, and could possibly cause disease, if it's a pathogenic microbe, then we say you have an infection. Infection does not always mean a disease, but it could lead to it. And then once you have a disease, that's when the infectious agent, the pathogen, is actually disrupting homeostasis. Okay? So one good example of an infection is the herpes virus. In herpes simplex 1, that virus lives in the neurons but it, it, in part of our body, but it doesn't cause any disease process. But something can trigger the disease and some stressor, and then we see the disease expressed like cold sores or sores around the mouth, okay? And so, um, so you, can, you can say that the area is contaminated and then you have an infection but the infection is not being expressed and not causing any disease unless triggered by something. So it's sort of a process here. Now, um, when we talk about uh, one, of the, one of the key, to, one of the big terms I do want to mention before we move on is this one called sepsis or septic. Okay. Well, if you know what a septic tank is, when you live like on a farm or somewhere rural, when you flush the toilet, all the, all the waste goes to a septic system. So when we talk about it, and a septic system is filled with toxins and, and all sorts of stuff that would make you sick. Nobody wants to hang out in a septic tank like they would a hot tub. Um, and you would get extremely ill from all the poisons and toxins that you would absorb. So when we talk about sepsis or septic, what we mean is um, poisoning due to toxins from microbes, usually some kind of microbial infection. So an infection can cause sepsis in an area of the body. And sometimes when we talk about sepsis, we're talking about a systemic infection. So let's say um, a person has a wound on a part of their body. So you have an infection on your foot. If the bacteria invade deep enough and get in your blood, then it can travel all over your body and become seated in different um, foci or, lo or locations. And so we said this person's septic or their, their system has gone septic or they're experiencing sepsis. And sometimes we use the term septicemia. Well, anytime you see emia, emia comes from heme, which is blood. So septicemia is when sepsis is in the bloodstream. It's a systemic infection in the blood that can be pretty bad, okay? Now, <clears throat> now we're gonna come back to a couple of these, and, and, and I may do them now so that we can skip them later, but when we talk about septicemia, you can talk about different types of emia. Anytime, as I said, Emia refers to something in the blood. So if I told you you have bacteremia, that means you have bacteremia, you have bacteria in your blood, and they are there. It's a systemic infection. They can travel all over the body. If I talk about viremia, I'm talking about a virus that's in your blood. Um, if I'm talking about toxemia, then toxemia means that you have some toxins spreading throughout your blood. And it, it, it's a systemic infection. You've gone septic. And so bacteremia is a type of septicemia due to bacteria. Viremia is a septicemia due to vi uh, viruses being present. Toxic toxemia is uh, one due to uh, toxins being present in the blood. Now, 
A few more definitions and then we'll move on to a couple of other things. When we're talking about infections, we need to talk about this term, the primary infection. A primary infection is a new infection to a host, okay? It's the first sign of infection in what was already an otherwise healthy individual. So we can talk about the first signs of infection in an otherwise healthy individual or the new infection of a host. Um, so, um, you know, this is when something first occurs in a person, primary meaning the first. Now, when we talk about secondary infection, the secondary infection is sort of a second infection that occurs after another infection. So when we talk about this term, this is an infection that follows a primary infection. So for example, if a person has a cold and their immune system gets somewhat compromised, well then they might pick up some other infection later on. Um, and, uh, and, and so you might get some bacterial infection, like something that gets seeded in the throat and causes an upper respiratory infection that started with the common cold. The cold was the primary infection, and then the bacterium invading the body, um, with, like, uh, like, like strep throat, would be a secondary infection, okay? Um, when we talk about what's called a super infection, This is uh, an infection that occurs due to a decrease in resident flora. Usually, after antibiotic treatment. Okay? So a super infection is some kind of secondary infection. And, and I should say it's a secondary infection due to a decrease in the resident flora. So Essentially what happens here is let's say you get an infection that's bacterial and you get an antibiotic and you get a really strong one as you take it not only does the antibiotic kill the bad guys the, the uh, primary infection but it can also kill some of the bacteria that are resident say in your normal gut or, or in the vagina or in the oral cavity and then due to the decrease of those normal healthy bacteria that are the resident flora or part of the microbiome um, another infection can occur. And this, co this occurs because of a concept we've talked before, which is called uh, uh, antimicrobial inhibition or microbial inhibition or microbial competition, not antimicrobial, microbial inhibition or microbial competition. So if one organism inhabits an area, sometimes the presence of that organism can change the environment to prevent other organisms or make it more difficult for them to, to live there. There's a, there's a, a type of uh, organism that lives in the vagina, lactobacillus, that causes uh, an acidic pH in the vagina so that other bacteria don't grow very well there. But if you take an antibiotic that kills off a lot of those and the pH changes, now other bacteria can move in and cause a UTI and cause infections. So we would call that a super infection. It's a secondary infection that, that's caused due to a decrease in the normal flora or microbiome, usually after some kind of antibiotic treatment, okay? Um, and then the last one that we can talk about is called a mixed infection. And when we have a mixed infection, it means more than one thing is mixed. It means that there's an infection due to uh, more than one pathogen. Okay, that's all that a mixed infection is, all right? Um, now, when we're talking about infections and we're talking about bacteria growing on the body and living in the body, one of the things that I wanna talk about briefly is what we call symbiosis. 
Okay. Let me see if this color shows up very well. I'm writing with this color, and I don't even know if you can really read it. Yeah, you can. It's okay. So symbiosis. Well, sim means with, and bio means to live. And anytime we have an osis, it's the process. So symbiosis is the process of one or more organisms living together. Okay. And when we talk about symbiosis, that's all it means. It means two or more organisms oops, living together. We call this symbiosis. There are three types of symbiosis. There's three ways in which organisms that can, can live together. One is called commensalism. Okay. So in commensalism, what happens is one organism, usually we refer to it as the parasite, um, the second organism that's living in within the host, but one organism benefits the other neither benefits nor is harmed. So when you have a, uh, a commensal uh, relationship, that means one organism is going to benefit. It gains something from the relationship. The other one is not either going to benefit nor is it going to be hurt. It's just going to pretty much be unaware of the situation. Okay. So we call that commensalism. Mutualism is when both the host and parasite benefit. Okay? Now I'm using the term parasite in a very loose term here. In a very specific term, when we're talking about a parasite, we're usually talking about some kind of eukaryotic organism that lives within a host like a protozoan, or a fungus, um, uh, or a helminth living in a parasitic uh, relationship, which is the third one we're gonna talk about. For example, tapeworms will benefit at the detriment of the host, um, or heartworms and a dog. The heartworm would be the parasite, the dog would be the host, and the dog is killed by the parasite eventually. So we would call that a parasitic relationship. Um, I'm using the term parasite in the more loose sense, meaning anything that lives within a host cell. Um, but in a parasitic relationship, this means the parasite benefits, the host is harmed. Like tapeworms or um, like uh, heartworms in a dog, or if you were going to talk about something like uh, like chlamydia, which is a sexually transmitted disease, um, the bacterium is going to be growing like crazy. The host is going to be harmed. It could cause UTIs eventually, it could cause renal failure and all sorts of other problems. In mutualism, both the host and the parasite benefit. A good example of mutualism, although it doesn't involve uh, humans, is uh, the microbes that live um, in the gut of certain ruminants like cows and things that eat grass. There are microbes that can break down the cellulose and the plant cell walls and allow them to digest plants. Humans don't have that ability, at least for grasses and certain types of plants. And so we would call that, call that a mutual relationship because the organism is getting nutrients from the situation, but so is the host, okay? Now, um, uh, another example of mutualism, by the way, would be E. coli. E. coli benefit from the waste. They feed off some of the, the compounds that are in the waste in our feces and our colon. And they release certain vitamins like vitamin K, which we benefit from. So that's a mutualistic relationship, okay? Um, in a parasitic relationship, as I described, the host is harmed. The other organism gains some benefit, okay? Now... <clears throat> Let me erase all this. 
And let me take a drink of water because my throat is getting a little dry. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the normal gut flora, you're going to hear this term a lot. Okay? We call this the normal flora of the body. Okay? Flora really comes from the term flower, which means plants. And so this term is being replaced. When we talk about what's called the flora and fauna, when a biologist would study a particular area, they would discuss the flora and fauna of that area. The fauna would be the animal life. The flora would be the plant life growing there. Well, they started using this term generically to talk about any organism that grows within an area, within an area not necessarily plants. So we're talking about like the normal gut flora would be all the enteric bacteria that live within our gut normally. The flora now is being replaced with the term microbiome or the term microbiota, which simply means the living microbes in an area, okay? Um, and our microbiome are those organisms that live in our body. Now, when we talk about the types of flora, um, we're just talking about the organisms living in an area, okay? There's different types of flora. One would simply be called resident flora, or sometimes we call them the normal flora, okay? These are the flora that occupy an area indefinitely, okay? They're there all the time. So, um, they're, they're present in our body throughout our life. And again, when we're talking about resident flora or normal flora, we, what we really mean is our microbiome. Those bacteria and microbes that live on and in our body all the time, from the time we're born until we die, or at least from when they enter the body until we die, and they're usually in a mutualistic relationship. We're benefiting from them and they're benefiting from us. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that we know, for example, is we have some uh, resident flora or part of our microbiome. We have some, when we talk about resident flora, we can talk about the external flora, which are the ones that live on the surfaces of the body, like your skin and conjunctiva. And we can talk about the internal flora. The internal flora live inside the body. They would be ones that live like in the oral cavity, in the digestive tract, in the urinary tract, in the reproductive tract, um, some that live in our ears and, and some they, the cavities inside the body. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about these flora, one of the things that we know that say, for example, we're talking about the external flora, you can wash them away, try to, right? So if you wash your hands and scrub your body in the shower, you can decrease the number of the resident flora, but you're never going to eliminate them. And eventually those numbers come back. Or if you use a mouthwash and rinse your mouth out and you kill some of the bacteria, they're still going to repopulate the mouth. You cannot eliminate the resident flora. Okay? Um, when we talk about what are called transient flora, when we talk about anything being transient, we're talking about something that, that you know, transfers from area to area or moves from area to area. Transient flora are not permanent. To the body. Um, they can live on the body, but they occur sort of um, uh, sporadically. Um, they, they can be, so one of the things that we say that they're not permanent to the body, but they can be cultured from the body. They can be transferred to our body temporarily, but they can be eliminated. For example, if you were to get some bacterium on your hands, that's not normal to your skin. Like Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis live on our skin, you know, and in our hair. They're normal flora or resident flora. If you wash your hands and your skin and you use hand sanitizer, you might decrease the number, but they're going to grow back. But we don't normally have E. coli on our hands. Now, if you use the restroom and you, um, 
you're going to get some E. coli on your hands, especially if you uh, defecate and you wipe. If you don't wash your hands and you go and touch something, someone would be able to culture E. coli from your skin. If you go and wash your hands later and use uh, antiseptic of some sort, then you will eliminate them from your hands. They won't live there permanently. So we would say that they are transient flora. They can be transferred to the body and be cultured from the body, but they're not permanent. They can be eliminated. And then the, um, the last group I want to talk about, and I'm running out of room, it gets really hard to write on the bottom of the board and you can't read my handwriting the further down I go. I really need to figure out a better way to do all of this, but I haven't, and I'm pressed for time. So the last group of flora that I want to talk about are called the opportunistic flora. Okay? Um, and just like an opportunistic flora, the term opportunistic comes from the term opportunity. These don't normally enter an area or colonize an area or contaminate an area unless the conditions are just right. So, um, so these are microbes that can cause disease in the, or in specific circumstances. Or we might say, as the opportunity presents itself. For example, again, Staphylococcus aureus lives in our skin, doesn't cause any infections or disease. But if you get cut and they enter the body and get into the blood, then we might say that's an opportunistic microbe. It took advantage of that opportunity. Um, so opportunistic microbes or opt opportunistic flora or flora that can cause disease but are normally not harm um, they're normally harmless so it's very specific conditions or just the right opportunity they can move into a new area and result in disease okay now um, a couple of things that I do want to talk about by the way um, I want to talk about something called a nosocomial infection Noso comes from, if you speak Spanish, you know the terms like nosotros, which means ours. So, and comio means to lie or coma. So nosocomia means to lie within ourselves. So a nosocomial infection is also now called a hospital acquired infection, okay, or HAIs. A hospital-acquired infection or a nosocomial infection occurs when someone is in the hospital and then they pick up an infection that they didn't have before they came into the hospital. Um, they're not all that uncommon because as you work in a hospital and you are exposed to patients with different infections, hospital staff, employees, healthcare professionals, very often have a much larger transient flora, a num different number of bacteria that can be found on the body due to their constant exposure to different microorganisms. And as you work with one patient, you might go into the room with another patient and you might transfer some bacteria there or some infectious agent, and now that patient now has what's called a hospital-acquired infection or a nosocomial infection. So nosocomial infections or hospital-acquired infections are infections that are um, acquired in a hospital or from medical staff because medical staff very often have a higher transient infection rate. One of the things that happens very often when a person begins working in healthcare is that you get sick a lot the first year or so from different things that you pick up and eventually you build immunity to it all, but you can still carry around um, microorganisms. Um, like I said, not always does an infection cause disease. You could be carrying an infection and transmit that organism to somebody else and yet never experience the disease itself, but someone else whose immune system cannot keep that infectious agent at bay might get really sick, especially if they're immunocompromised, they're already in the hospital, okay? Um, now, uh, one last thing I wanna talk about and then we'll wrap up this video. Our flora can change, our microbiome can change over time. We acquire our microbiome, some of it comes at birth, some of the bacteria and the things that, um, that we pick up 
we pick up as we pass through the birth canal and begin to be touched at the beginning of life, like Staphylococcus epidermidis and aureus, and some of the other bacteria that we pick up. Some are acquired through breast milk and through breastfeeding and, and feeding off the skin and touching the world. And then we build up, we get exposed to these bacteria and they take residence in our body. And there's specific bacteria that are, are taken into the gut through breastfeeding. And again, those do what we call microbial competition um, or microbial inhibition where the, the, the uh, large volume of a particular organism in an area might produce some kind of chemical or substance that prevents other microbes from invading that area. And it turns out that some of our microbiome is very good at preventing certain disease uh, states. And that's why there, we are now discovering and, um, and starting to push again Breastfeeding is really important. Babies get a number of um, uh, antibodies through breast milk, through breastfeeding, and they also get uh, some of the microbiome from that, which can prevent certain diseases of the digestive tract. And it turns out that um, studies have shown that babies that are breastfed um, with natural breast milk uh, develop a much stronger and healthier microbiome and are much less susceptible to specific diseases than babies who are only fed formula. So um, our microbiome is developed and changing over time. And uh, um, another thing that we know that happens is that because certain hormones um, are lipid and cholesterol derivatives, the sex hormones, estrogen levels can be very high in a newborn due to the absorption of estrogen from mom who's, who's secreting estrogen during pregnancy. And um, that estrogen can help change the pH of certain tissues, particularly the vagina. And so um, little babies sometimes are not susceptible to things like certain uh, uh, vaginal infections due to the presence and growth of what are called some lactobacilli. Um, they won't get as many UTIs initially, but if they're not getting the lactobacilli through breast milk and they don't, those lactobacilli do not, um, uh, do not colonize the, the vagina or the urinary tract, then any E. coli from a dirty diaper that isn't immediately changed can enter the urinary tract and result in uh, urinary tract infections. So, um, so estrogen can have an impact on UTIs and sometimes prevent that. And that's why UTIs can be much more common at different parts of the menstrual cycle in females. Now, I don't want to continue, we could go on and on and on about this stuff, but I hope that you have some idea about some of the definitions that you need to know, and we're going to continue to use these definitions in the next couple of videos. And you also understand a little bit the, about the flora and the microbiome. Now we're going to move away from just the resident flora or the microbiome, and we're going to start talking about disease, particular bacterial uh, diseases and infectious diseases and uh, how we detect them, how they're transmitted, how they are described. But that's gonna be in the next video. So I hope that you learned something from this. I hope you learned some definitions and some terminology, and we're gonna use them in the next video. I hope you had as much fun as I did, because I always have fun doing this. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.